tales for dark nights. Good evening, everyone. This is Jonathan West, winner of the 2017 Evil Idol voice acting competition with an important announcement. Coming to you all soon, the most collaborative, interactive project we have ever endeavored to produce. If you'd like choose your own adventure style stories and audience participation, you'll enjoy what we have in store. Beginning this month, our newest featured series follows the tale of a man who wakes up in a strange place, seemingly alone unaware of when or how he got there, or where he is. Shortly after waking, he finds that someone, or something, seems to be controlling his destiny, as if scripting his life as he goes. His life, as he finds, very much resembles a... Waking Nightmare. And who will decide where our protagonist wakes? You do. All of you collectively. And who decides where the story goes from there? Again, you do. The hive mind that is our audience. With the conclusion of each chapter of the story, we will invite you, our fans, to write the next chapter and post it as a comment on the current chapter, allowing you to choose how the story unfolds. The comment or chapter which receives the most votes from the audience will become canon and will become the next official chapter in the saga. It will then be adapted to audio along with other chapters and be released as the next episode. Then the process will repeat. We won't know where the story goes, or if it will ever end. Because you'll be the ones writing it. And everyone will have their chance to win the next chapter. And every chapter will provide another opportunity to try and get your chapter accepted. Best of all, participation is 100% free and all authors of accepted chapters will be fully credited for their work, both on-screen and off, and will have the opportunity to become listed as a featured author on our www.simplyscarypodcast.com website, with permanent links to them and their social media pages and their websites. If you're an author with a book for sale, we'll help you promote it. Got a read a page? We'll send more eyeballs to your other stories. Everyone will have the opportunity to contribute to this waking nightmare. We've never done anything like this before, and we don't think anyone else has either. And we're very excited to see where it goes. If this is something you'd be interested in participating in or listening to, please leave a comment below and let us know. Voting on the opening scene will take place on Wednesday, March 21st, 2018 at 6 p.m. U.S. Central Time to coincide with the release of the next episode of scary stories told in the dark. Then we'll run through the end of the day on Sunday, March 25th, 2018. At that time, we will tabulate the votes and the opening scene location with the most votes will open our story, which officially begins in April. See you all soon in the comments. Rebirth, from the Knife Point Horror Collection by Soren Narnia. Narrated by Jason Hill. My name is Christian Barrett. For the past two years, I've put out monthly episodes of a video podcast called Creaky Footsteps a casual tour of various supposedly haunted houses in my general geographical area, that is, the eastern part of South Carolina. It's consisted of little more than me shooting some footage of an abandoned house somewhere and narrating it with text based on dubious local legends, some of which, I must admit, I created myself to bolster my content. I began to get more and more subscribers over the course of the podcast, though I was never more than a one-man operation. For the second anniversary episode, I decided to try something a little more ambitious. Last Friday night, I got off work at my small IT company in Charleston. After grabbing a quick dinner, I started driving north. In 90 minutes, I had crossed the state line. Another two hours passed and I had entered North Carolina. 
I was in an area I had never been to and I was wholly unfamiliar with. My destination was the town of Lenore on Oslo Bay. The town was considered the shame of Pamlico County, if not the state itself. It was apparently a suffering backwater, connected to civilization only by rural Route 78 called Loon's Neck Road. Once, long ago, it had received cargo boats at its rundown docks, but that stopped in the 70s. The town had less than a thousand people left, and in fact it had become the largest incorporated area with the fewest citizens in all of North Carolina. Every part of it had fallen into neglect, judging from the few photos I had seen. Not helping matters was a book published by some hack in the late 90s called The Town with Many Eyes. A collection of allegedly true campfire tales ascribing all sorts of supernatural upheaval to the place. I had never read it. It was only because the town had developed such a reputation, in fact, that I had refrained for so long from doing some sort of episode of the podcast there. It almost seemed too obvious. I was only 30 minutes away from Lenore, and I'd begun to look for signs of Loon's Neck Road when my cell phone rang on the seat beside me. When I said hello, I was greeted by a voice I didn't recognize. A man introduced himself as Vincent Muehlbeck, a historian. He didn't know me, and he had heard I put out a show about haunted places. He'd seen on my website that my next episode to be released two days from now was going to be about Lenore. I confirmed this information, a little confused about how he had gotten my personal phone number, but it didn't occur to me then just to ask. This man, Vincent Muehlbeck, spoke to me very plainly and directly in a flat and entirely emotionless voice. He asked me to please not go to Lenore. Not at all. It could be very dangerous for me. His tone was so serious, I almost laughed. It was so... disorienting. When I asked him what he meant, he said he wasn't at liberty to explain, but he had no stake in what happened to me beyond wanting to simply warn me or anyone with me that something was going on in Lenore that was a threat to anyone inside the town. I was at a total loss. I told him I was in fact headed there at that moment and there was a long silence on the line. When this man spoke again, he reaffirmed to me that this was a terrible mistake, that my life might be at risk. I asked him to back up and explain from the beginning how he had come to call me, but suddenly the line went dead. He had hung up. I lowered the phone from my ear and focused on the long, dark road ahead of me, trying to replay this brief conversation in my head while navigating by the light of my high beams. The area was growing hilly, and there were still some patches of snow and ice in the road from a light dust dusting the night before. At last, I felt I had to simply slow down to about 30 miles per hour just to process everything more easily. There had been a certain familiarity to Mielbeck's name. Something about the way he spoke. If he was a nutcase, he was completely convincing. I wish there had been some inkling of hysteria in his voice. But there had been none. I stopped for gas at a place called Morton's and walked to the edge of the tarmac to clear my head. I checked Muehlbeck's number and dialed it again. The connection was terrible. But there was no answer anyway. To make myself feel better, I then walked up to the cashier's window and asked the man for directions to Lenore, which I didn't really need. I just wanted to know if he'd come out with some superstitious nonsense. He didn't. I asked him specifically if he'd ever heard anything strange about the place. He had not. I got back in my car and drove on. Very soon I saw the first mention of Lenore. The word was printed alone on a small brown metallic sign. It said only how many miles away it was. Steering with one hand again, I placed a call to my wife... She picked up on the first ring. I asked her if she had given my name to someone named Vincent Muehlbeck. She said no. So I asked her to do a quick search on the internet for him. She would have to call me back a little later. She was visiting relatives in New York, and when I told her where I was headed, she surprised me by telling me she was worried. 
She'd read some things about Lenore in the past and wasn't crazy about the idea of me going there alone at night with a video camera. I told her it was fine. I was on Loon's Neck Road in the next 20 minutes. It truly was a seemingly endless country drive, bending away from the ocean with nothing but depleted fields and marshlands on either side. No car seemed to come from the other direction and there was no one behind me. A sign even smaller than the first one I had seen let me know I had reached my destination. Again, it was just that one word, Lenore. I entered in the town south side, which looked like it had once housed the industrial district. There was a collection of decaying brick buildings, most of them unmarked. A couple with signs that looked like they were at least 50 or 60 years old. Only one street light in three was working. Not having any specific map of the town, I cruised slowly east toward Onslow Bay, which I reached in about five minutes. Two piers jutted out into a narrow part of the bay. There were no boats in sight. I couldn't tell if a single one had been there recently. It certainly didn't look like it. I bypassed Lenore's main street, which was the usual collection of shuttered shops, and got into the more residential part of town. I went past something called Bill Williams Elementary School, and there was a stretch of cheap row houses that went for more than a mile. I started to worry that I hadn't planned enough, and that the building I was looking for would take me forever to find, but I lucked across it soon enough. Off Tower View Road, there was Mason, and it dead-ended at uh, St. Anesius Church. This place was the main reason I had come to Lenore. I parked on the side of the road in my choice of spots, since there was nothing near the church but an empty field and some cracked tennis courts surrounded by a chain-link fence. I took my camera and my heavy-duty flashlight and got out of the car into the cold. Looking around me, I saw no one. And it occurred to me I hadn't seen a single soul in the streets since I'd gotten there. Two cars had driven past me, and that was it. This was on a Friday night, a little past 11.30. The church was dark, not a single light visible from the outside. But that was expected, since the place was shut down years before. I walked up the steps to the front doors, expecting them to be locked. But they weren't. I looked briefly behind me to see if anyone was watching. Of course there was no one. I pushed the right-hand door inward just a bit. It was incredibly heavy, but it opened with no problem. I decided to go all the way in and close it behind me, turning my flashlight on since there was no electricity. There I was, inside St. Anesius Church, which had made Lenore briefly famous in 2004. Instead of tearing it down, they'd merely stopped using it. But apparently the building was going to remain at the end of this little road, well, forever. Half of the pews had been ripped out. Exactly half. Just the ones on the left side. There was no longer any altar, and no adornments of any kind. The stained glass windows were intact, but there wasn't much else to signify that services had once been performed there. There was a tiny bit of light after all, and seeing it nearly sent me back out into the cold for the shock of spotting it. On the filthy floor, in the center of the church, was a single candle, sitting on what looked like a dinner plate. The candle was thick, and had once been fairly tall, but it was wearing down to almost nothing. There was so much burned wax surrounding it that it might have been burning there for a day or more. Someone had been here very, very recently. I shone the beam of the flashlight all around, now paranoid that I was being watched. But it really seemed that I was totally alone. I would have normally set my video camera up on its tripod now and shot some video, especially since I had never expected this lucky break of getting inside the church. But I felt I wanted to be out of there fast. 
so I could have just got some handheld shots of the interior for the purpose of overdubbing the narration later. Here I would say, right here, the six children were found in 2004. None of them yet harmed, but dragged and then literally taped down to the floor between the two aisles of pews. Taped down clumsily with electrical tape, so they wouldn't be able to move if they awoke. On each of their palms, someone had painted the symbol of an eye, divided into a clear gap between the two halves. Inside that gap was a six-pointed star. In the back of the church, Father Pat Tarkenton was found, stabbed to death. Parked outside had been the van that had been driven by the woman who had abducted the children six hours before from a nearby playground. This was the culminating incident in a chain of recent cult practices that had brought such a sinister aura to Lenore that would stick forever. It was said that there was not one but two cults working in the town, leaving drawings in the sides of buildings that showed an eye split down the middle. Vandalism had occurred, assaults, arrests, yet absolutely no one ever admitted involvement with any cult until 2004. The woman who had abducted the children had apparently agreed to cooperate with the authorities, but two days after her arrest, she'd been found in her cell, dead of a heart attack at age 26. Far stranger still was the fate of the children who had been taken and branded with the black ink. They were all dead by 2009, all of them of various causes. Two car accidents, two cases of leukemia, and a brother and sister both dead in a fire. And so Lenore, already a place people didn't like to talk about, was branded a cult town. Its population had dropped 50% in 10 years. There was just enough information about what had happened to give rise to endless speculation and not anywhere near enough facts to really know what was going on here, if anything was going on at all. I got my footage of the interior of St. Anesius Church and turned to leave. I shone the flashlight against the doors and saw what had been painted on them in letters four feet high. It was a date. Twelve, nineteen... 2010. This was today's date. Wanting to be out of there right now, I opened the door as it cracked to peer out onto the street. The moment I was sure no one was out there, I left the church, moving briskly down the steps. I didn't feel safe again until I was inside my car. I forced a little laugh out just to make myself feel, well, ridiculous for locking the door. I started the car right up and pulled away from the curb. I was not leaving, not just yet. I didn't want to leave until I had a little more footage of the town, and after I had confirmed that the rumors about Lenore's lack of cell phone reception were completely true, I had to take care of one last thing. I drove past the tiny post office and spotted a payphone beside it. I parked again and I called my wife. She seemed very relieved to hear from me. She said the reason the name Vincent Muehlbeck had sounded familiar to me was because it was connected to the case of Ralph Brogley. Ralph Brogley had been a prisoner in a maximum security prison in Montreal and died during an apparent botched exorcism. Vincent Muehlbeck, who was now a wanted man in Canada, had been the name of a man who'd hired the pair of exorcists who'd accidentally or otherwise drowned Brogley in an empty part of the prison after they'd been smuggled into the building somehow. I had no choice but to tell my wife that, yes, if it was the same Vincent Muehlbeck, I had spoken to him that night. But I wouldn't give her the details. I assured her I was leaving Lenore on my own way back home and that nothing out of the ordinary had happened here. I'd explain everything later. Back in the car, I cruised slowly down toward the north side of town, pointing the camera through the windshield as I drove just to get whatever very rough shots I could. I wasn't going to have the fortitude to do my usual two or three remotes here. 
I would come back later, maybe during the day with a friend, but most likely my adventure in Lenore tonight was over. Still, I saw no one on the streets until in the north part of town, which was entirely residential. I could make out two people running across the road ahead of me, far in the distance, from one side of the street to the other and then out of sight. About two minutes later, a car came in the other direction, and it visibly slowed as it approached me. I actually sped up, very, very unnerved. I glanced to my left as I passed the car, but I couldn't see inside it. When I saw that it had stopped completely, I took an immediate right turn and sped up. The car did not follow. Another left took me into a more wooded area. I didn't want to turn around, so I kept going. I did realize I could easily get lost, but I wanted to get away from that car. I tried taking one more right and found myself in a very quiet part of town, all single-story houses and a private school. A cemetery came up on my left, or more accurately, a gravel path that led back into it. I assumed this was Crown Point Cemetery, a photo of which adorned the cover of the town with many eyes. It was the one story in the book I was familiar with, having read it on some website. This one actually had a little validity to it, since there were newspaper sources to back it up. I turned into the cemetery, which had no gate. I bumped along the gravel very slowly, going past wildly uneven rows of very, very old tombstones, some probably dating back to the Revolutionary War. The cemetery would have been quite ugly during the day, and was more so at night, pockmarked with random rises and depressions. Scraggly weeds, unkempt grass. The path went back about a quarter of a mile and stopped abruptly. The tombstone I wanted to look at was reportedly taller than all the others. Otherwise, I would have never found it. It was set about 20 feet off the path. There was nothing really remarkable about its design, only supposedly its inscription. I stopped the car in the middle of the path and killed the headlights. I grabbed my flashlight and my camera again, and I got out. I felt confident no one was around. This particular tombstone belonged to a man named Curtis Palliser, the man who had founded Lenore. As soon as the beam of my flashlight fell across the front of the stone, I saw that in this one case, legend was actually truth. I read the inscription twice before I took some shots of it for the episode, keeping in mind that Palliser had been an importer of impeccable reputation during his life, with not a single whisper of wrongdoing. This is what I read on that stone. God pity his soul, and forgive him for his wretched deeds, and let men be watchful, that he does not stir from his slumber beside the beast. Born 1780, died 1867. And that was all. Palliser's original tombstone had been secretly replaced by persons unknown sometime in the seventh winter after his death. And there, for some reason, this one had stayed... Since then, no one had uncovered a single plausible story from the past to bring shame to his name. Not a one. Yet there was this inscription, and no protest enough from anyone to remove it after all these years. A couple of snow flurries landed on my head as I hiked out of the cemetery. Back inside the car, I tried to find a weather report, but every station seemed to be speaking from under a blanket of static, so I gave up. I snaked down a road where more working-class houses stood. There was one whose front door was wide open, leading into total darkness, and one where a Doberman pincer stalked across the lawn slowly, tracking my car until I was out of sight. I turned onto Kingman Street. My headlights picked up something out in the road ahead. It was a human body. I pulled over, leaving the engine running, and I ran out. 
I knew the man was dead. The trail of dark blood that ran from him flowed all the way to the side of the road. He lay face down on the pavement. I turned him over and saw that he had been brutally stabbed at least a dozen times through his sweatshirt. He was about fifty years old, his eyes open and staring. Kingman was an unusually dark road. Houses were on each side. I let the man go and ran toward the first one I saw. There was a single light on inside, a feeble one, so I knocked on the door several times, trying not to make it too forceful lest I scare the people in there. There was no answer. The windows on the lower floor were just too high for me to see into. I left the house and ran across the driveway to the next one. There didn't seem to be much life in that one either, but I had to try. Again, there was no answer to my constant knocking. The fact that there were two cars in the driveway told me that there must be someone home, so I moved to my left and raised myself onto my toes to see into the living room. What I saw there sent me around to the back of the house in a frantic attempt to find some way in. I climbed over a short chain-link fence and crossed a small back lawn to a large porch where a grill sat uncovered. The back door was ajar. Without thinking, I went right in. I found myself in the kitchen of this house. There were lights on in here. I saw dishes in the sink. Beyond that was the living room. And another body. It was a woman sitting in a rocking chair. On the TV set in the corner, the DVD menu for a documentary about the Civil War played on and on. The woman had no visible wounds, but... I have never seen a look of terror like I saw on her face, which had gone almost utterly white. Her hair was cocked at a strange angle, strands of it thankfully obscuring her eyes. I didn't know how long she had been dead. There was something on the wall behind the television, something scrawled there, what looked like black paint. From a distance, it might have passed for an accidental blotch, but looking a little closer, it was obvious that I was looking at a crude drawing of a dead tree. It was meant to be little more than a silhouette. It stretched from about chest level across all the way to the ceiling. That was it, nothing more. I looked for a phone there only briefly. When I didn't see one in the living room or the kitchen, I ran out the back door again, frightened of spending a single moment more in that house. But outside was no better, for the feeling of being watched was completely constant now. I ran through the backyard and climbed over the rear section of the chain-link fence onto the next property. There were more lights on in that house in front of me than any other I had seen. I tore across the backyard, nearly snapping my foot when it came to rest on the edge of a rabbit hole. There was no back porch, just a back door. I turned the knob before even knocking, and the door was open, just like the house across the way. The kitchen was the first room upon entry. Everything seemed very neat and clean. I called out for someone, but there was no answer. The contents of the living room suggested someone here was moving in or out soon. Lots of things in crates and boxes. The television set was dark. I called out again. No answer. The sense that something was horribly wrong here as well sunk into me quickly. Almost a physical sensation in my chest, in my lungs. Things inside were locking up. I went to the staircase in the corner of the room. It was unlit. Somehow I found the courage to start up the stairs, but I couldn't bring myself to call out any longer. I, it scared me too much to make any sound at all. Even my quiet footsteps on the stairs as I climbed was too much. I stopped when I saw a very small streak of paint, black paint. It had smudged a corner of the wall at the staircase's blind turn. Sensing how dark it was up there, I turned on my flashlight. And then I just stood on the third step with my back to the wall, trying to control my breathing. 
for at least a full minute. There was no way, I thought, no way I could go up the rest of those stairs, but it, it was at about that point that I became someone different, someone almost unrecognizable to myself. Some bizarre, primal need to see what was up there completely took over, despite all my common sense to the contrary. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. The belief that I was so, so close to death, my own death, actually pushed me closer towards it. I turned the blind corner, and there were six more steps ahead of me. I had to use the flashlight to see. The beam shone up into the hallway above, and before I even took one more step, it caught a bare human foot just beyond the top one. The rest of the body was hidden from view behind the near wall. When I got to the top of the staircase, the rest of the image came into view. It was a woman, lying face down. She had been moving toward the bathroom at the end of the hall when she had fallen from her wounds, or maybe been pinned down while they were inflicted. I turned the flashlight to my left toward the bedroom she had obviously come from. The door was open. I walked toward it. It was pitch black in there. I no longer cared or even minded. My reality had become so nightmarish that I was treating it all like a nightmare, something something unreal. I crossed the threshold into the room. This time the killer, or killers, had painted the tree above the headboard of the bed. There had been a terrible struggle here. A lamp had been knocked over. The sheets were completely off the bed. The headboard itself had been dislodged and broken. In the end, the man inside the bedroom had been overwhelmed. He was in one corner of the room below an open window. There was more black paint there. The date had once again been written in rapid, almost illegible slashes. Through the window, I could see the upper windows of the house beside this one. All this was obscured by a foul odor of something burning or having been burned. It was the strongest near the corner where the body lay. I trained the flashlight there again, longer this time, and I moved closer. What I beheld was an impossibility. The dead man's skin had been charred black from head to toe, including his hands and his bare feet. But his clothing was not even partially singed. He wore a Tennessee Titan sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. None of it was damaged. Yet he himself had been utterly immolated. No stab wounds either. Only some freakish burning something else. He'd been holding something in his right hand when he died, still clutching it tightly. It was a knife, but one unlike any I had ever seen, double-bladed, almost as if the blades were fangs, and thick, eight inches or more in length, with a wooden, carefully carved handle. I suppose he had meant to use it, but never got the chance. I did not even run out of the house. I went down the stairs with one more glance at the dead woman and walked out the front door as if I lived there, and I crouched on the lawn and looked off at the body that was still lying in the middle of the road. I wanted to lie down in the grass and close my eyes and never, never wake up. But I forced myself back on my feet and toward the road. My car was still idling, I saw. I had left it running all this time. No one had taken it. No one had touched it. I was truly alone after all. 
I got in and threw the car into reverse. I turned completely around and started driving back the way I had come. But my mind had no conception of where I really was. I couldn't focus at all. I was driving blind, forgetting completely the turns I had made to get here. I just drove and drove. On the fronts of the two consecutive houses on Windvale Lane, images of the tree had been scrawled. It slowly came to me in little pieces the rumor and gossip I hadn't processed correctly before. The two cults the newspapers used to claim not only were they not aligned, but they were actively at war with one another. All nonsense, all of it, none of it proven, none of it understood. The sort of urban legend that took hold in a quiet town and eventually died. I finally saw a real living being in the Norwell past midnight. One street over from the silent bay, someone was sitting on a swing in a children's playground beside a daycare center. At first I just saw a shape and then the outlines of the face under the glow of a weak nearby street light. I pulled the car over to the curb and killed the engine. The person sitting on the swing didn't even look at me, didn't even look in my direction. I got out of the car and just stood for a moment, 50 feet or so away from the playground. The man and I, for I could see now it was a man, looked at each other. I finally dared to approach him, crossing the sidewalk and moving past a jungle gym. I told him I needed some help. He looked at me blankly, not responding. As I walked towards him, he was a man of middle age, well-dressed. I barely heard him ask me in a low voice if I was Christian Barrett. I stopped. When I asked him if he was Vincent Muehlbeck, he nodded slowly. I asked him what had happened here. I am now trying to remember his words to the best of my ability. To my first question, his response was only that Palliser's children had lost, and that tonight the tree would live again. To my question about whether he had called the police and if someone was coming to help, he merely shook his head and said it did not matter now. I didn't know what to ask next. Before I could venture another word, he stood up from the swing and advised me to not get back in my car, that it was best to not be seen. He said it would all be over soon enough, but I might be able to make it out of town if I wasn't seen. To this he added, he was sorry. He had been too late in coming here. Then he lifted his right hand to his mouth. He put something in, something very small, and swallowed it. A second later, he collapsed where he stood all at once as if he had been shot. He emitted a sick cough when he struck the ground. His left leg pounded again and again on the patch of dirt in front of the swing that had been worn away from the impact of so many children's feet. His body twisted as if something were climbing up his spine, and he were trying to shake it off, and then suddenly he lay still dead on the ground before me. I did not touch him. I did not try to revive him. I just knew it would be useless. My decision as to where to go next was made for me when I looked down the street. In the pool of yellow light thrown by a street lamp a hundred yards away, I saw two dark figures running in my direction. One of them was holding some long, thin object in his right hand. There was not enough time to make it back to my car, so I turned and ran across the playground into the darkness towards the empty ball field behind it. I made it far farther than I thought I could. When my lungs felt like they were going to seize up in the cold, sheer adrenaline took me forward. At no point as I ran across the faded baseball diamond into the woods at the end of the field did I look behind me. Only when I tripped over a heavy stone and slammed into the ground did I stop roll over and look through the trees at the stretch I had crossed. There was no one there. They had given up. Once again, I was alone in Lenore. This time I was in a place where no one could see me, and that's where I wanted to stay. 
I lay on the ground, my face pressed into the frost for a couple of minutes. And then I got to my feet and headed deeper into the woods that bordered the bay. I wasn't sure where I was walking. It didn't seem to matter. I was just, just enough to be off the streets, out of sight. My mind was working well enough to check my cell phone once again in a futile attempt to hope to get a signal. Again, there was nothing. I didn't have my flashlight with me. The woods were thick, even in the middle of winter. I stumbled forward, trying to keep my mind blank. My night vision brought everything more and more into focus. The stars were perfectly clear above me. They shone enough light that I could make little things out, initials carved onto a fallen log, an empty soda bottle lying beside a stick shaped like a W. These were the things around me when there came a sound that stopped me cold. The wind had just risen unexpectedly, colder, colder than ever before. When I heard a low moaning, it seemed to be coming from ahead and behind. This moaning became something more within seconds. It was as if the earth itself was crying out in pain. It rose and rose, and I looked all around me desperately. Another layer of sound emerged, something I can only describe as a voice, because there was no other way to describe it. Low, angry, bellowing one unending cry of rage. It got so loud I put my hands over my ears and I cried out. Maybe two hundred feet before me a giant shrieking mass of darkness was rising toward the sky. Something that was growing rapidly, reaching upwards, dwarfing everything around it. It was a tree ten times wider than any other in the woods and sprouting a thousand branches sprung up from nothing. As I stood there, screaming, the sound of its rage crushing whatever I could summon, the tree began to shake as it grew and grew and grew, those long branches waving and cracking violently. I remember a bright star suddenly disappearing as the tree's upper reaches blotched it out. So high now that within a minute it would scrape the clouds. I felt blood come out of my ears and trickle down each tree as my eardrums burst. The monstrous branches lashed out and I saw several of them snapping off with the force of its deafening quaking, falling to the ground below like, like people hurling themselves off a high ledge to their deaths. The unearthly roar must have traveled for miles. I felt it seize my spine and I collapsed to the ground, certain I would be dead in moments. The tree began to bend to the left and right as if it were trying to rip itself free of the ground. I saw a branch the height of a low airplane descend towards me, striking the trees that protected me and snapping in three pieces before falling out of sight. Then... Only about fifty feet off the ground, the most awful sight of all. Clinging to the tree that wrenched itself in all directions as if buffeted by a windstorm, were creatures, human-like creatures that proved to be actual humans, naked and streaked with filth. They were attempting to slither down the tree towards the ground, they were all over the tree, climbing downwards in fits and starts as they could manage, reaching out and grasping the bark with pale hands adhered to the trunk somehow. Even so, among the dozens of bestial humans born from the tree, I saw three or four of them flung off, losing their grip and falling into the darkness. One fell from a height so fast it appeared in the sky, tumbling towards as if from nowhere. I was on my knees, my hands clawing, my face, my lungs stripped from shrieking when everything went mercifully black. The last thing I felt was a single leaf blown by the wind striking the corner of my mouth. Such a minute detail tells me how real it all truly was. So that now as I sit in the basement of my house writing this down, I have confidence that I am not utterly insane. 
They found me on the side of Loon's Neck Road, two miles outside of Lenore. I spent a day in the hospital recovering from my injuries, telling no one my story until it was forced out of me by the police. I am still considered a prime suspect in the Lenore murders. There were in all 14 people killed, an alert reporter discovering that all of them were descendants of Curtis Palliser. The killings were obviously the work of many, of whom they think I may have even been the leader. I told them everything except what happened in the woods. I don't think they even believed me when I told them that Vincent Muehlbeck had committed suicide. The memory of his face when he took that pill is what most makes me believe that whatever happens to me is immaterial. The world itself may end soon enough for all I know. Something has been released. A seed has grown. There may be no monstrous things in the woods visible to the human eye, but... That doesn't mean anything. The truth was there with what Neil Beck did. Or maybe it'll just be Lenore that's stricken. That's something to hope for. Though when I wake up from my nightmares, it feels more likely that winter will never be leaving any of us. Not anymore. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.